to. By now, quite a lot of you will probably have realized that the key ship series is my definition of key ships, not necessarily what other people would call key ships, because I include in it ships which I consider, of course, key to history. Now, the thing is, what you find in most generic lists of key history and key ships is pretty much the same ships. And in fact, sometimes I swear all people have done is type into Google what are the most famous warships of all time, and then they just call that their key ships. Occasionally they go a little bit further. Occasionally. But I will say this, when I'm getting together with my pals, who are especially a certain free naval history pals, who we go wandering around Canada and other places with, um, it gets kind of funny. Because the ships we're talking about, yeah, we're talking about some of the big ships. Also talking about a lot of ships which probably no one's ever heard of. And some of these ships, why do I consider them key ships? Well, there are ships which are key ships from a technological point of view, and they certainly should be featured in the year of technology. There are key ships which are impactful in terms of technology from what comes out from the events they're involved in. So there are key ships, which of course, in the first moment, are key ships because they are examples of key technological progress or development. There are also the ships which are involved in events which kind of demonstrate what technological pro uh, uh, improvement needs to be made. And then there are key ships which change the world. I'm going to change the world in some way, which means you have to start thinking things through in a different way. One of those ships, which fits into probably more of the latter two than the former, by a long margin, is the Huasca. And I haven't listed where it's HMS or what it is in front of it, because it serves with both the uh, Peruvian Navy and the Chilean Navy. It's captured and then put into service by the Chileans. First starts life with the Peruvians. It takes part in the uh, eighteen seventy nine to eighteen eighty three War of the Pacific. It takes part in battles in the Peruvian Civil War with the Royal Navy. It takes part in the Chilean Civil War. And it's even survived today. It's still around as a memorial ship. In fact, when I've been looking at planning trips to places around the world for naval history trips, the really annoying thing for me about this ship is that really it's on its own in terms of a desert of naval history. And trying to figure out a sensible, tr viable trip which would include it ultimately comes down to a straight there and back and working out whether that video would be viable, uh, viable, uh, viable in terms of an economic front to actually pay for that trip because it's basically going down there for one ship An interesting thing working out these trips. So, Huasca. Shameless book plug. It's another way of helping pay, uh, helping in terms of paying for the book, uh, paying for the videos. I can uh, then, after all, accord in my finances. Sort of some of the books sold are down to the advertising in the in the video. Therefore, 
those funds should also be accorded with the fact of that video. More books coming soon. Now, let's put it away. Probably in the second half of this year. First half of this year is incredibly busy. So why Huasca? Well, I sort of talked about that, but begin with. But it's it's an interesting sh experience. This ship. It really is. It also seemed like quite a sensible moving on from the Scorpion, because this is also a monitor, an ironclad steam on a steam monitor ram. Or a steam ironclad monitor ram. It's ordered in 1864. It's built by the Laird Brothers in Birkenhead. Yeah, the forerunners of Camel Lads. The Laird Brothers. She served as the flagship of the Peruvian Navy and is currently the second oldest armored warship afloat after HMS Warrior. And is the oldest monitor still afloat. So, Camel Lads should probably be doing more to uh, include her in their advertising, because they can really claim a uh, claim to some age this way. A turret could fire directly ahead, or it could fire up to fifteen degrees. Either side, aft. Vertically, therefore, it has a hundred and twenty degrees, a uh, uh, hundred twenty degree arc of fire. So I can fire from here all the way around to here. Pretty useful. Not being able to fire aft is a problem, but it does allow it for more stability in water operations, which is kind of useful. And it's fitted with a hurricane deck. She also carried a stern chaser as a rule to stop people being able to run up behind her. She's a good ship, but again why are they building her? Why are they naming a ship after their 16th century Inca Emperor Huasca? Well, simple really. They're all going for power. You see, one of the interesting things about the South American states is for a long time, and it might seem strange to talk about this in the context of Peru and, well, especially today with Peru, and other parts of South America which seem quite so peaceful but the decolonization of South America was not a peaceful process and once the Spanish left yes the major power that stepped in to fill the major power role was largely the British, the Americans claiming they were, but never having the military power necessary to do so, really. And certainly not the economic power for quite a long time to do so. The major power wasn't interested in settling disputes. They were interested in selling arms to both sides. It's far more profitable. And so... What did they all do? They armed. They started fighting wars over territory, access to the sea, the various things they need, they wanted, they desired. 
There were various paths and ideas put forward for pan-South American unity. Yes. Even at certain points, Brazil was infected with that desire. The idea of taking over the whole of South America and it being one nation. For some reason, no other power outside of South America was ever keen on that idea. And the ones in South America could never decide over who would actually be running that. Luckily, those movements were usually fairly um, fringe in terms of popularity, but that still didn't stop wars breaking out with them being part of it. With the idea being you conquer this part, and then you conquer that part, and slowly you build up to the control the whole. Every acquisition making you stronger, making you more capable, making the end result in easier reach. Ships like the Huasca were part of it. Two 10 inch, 300 pound Armstrong guns in a single Coles turret. That was all weird, sorry. There you go. Seen here with a later edition of the bow. That is a significant amount of firepower. And a flexible amount of firepower. Four boilers installed, supplying a single shaft via a single horizontal return connecting rod steam engine. For those who watched my steam engine video oh, will know that the connect horizontal connecting rod was reliable but weird, wacky doodle, and exposed. So not something you wanted really in combat, but for a while it was considered very good because it's built based on some of the most well understood engines at the time, otherwise known as mining engines. She's fairly well armoured. She's not exactly massively long, but she's capable. And that's really what she's there for. She's capable. And if you think about it from a major power perspective, if Peru has this, what can I send to intimidate Peru? Let me say that again. What can I send to intimidate Peru if Peru has this? Hence, we have the Battle of Pacocha in 1877. And um, on the other side is HMS Shah, which was an unarmoured, well, how do I describe Shah? Uh, sort of in constant class vessel, sort of. Um, interesting iron, well, not ironclad, she's, a, she's an iron hulled, but uh, copper sheathed wooden frigate uh, built by Sir Edward Reed and laid down in 1870, launched in 1873 and completed in 1875. She's one of the vessels on one side. Another vessel on the British side is HMS Amethyst, which was a lead ship of course of the Amethyst class screw corvettes. And again, she's a wooden screw corvette. See where the problem's coming in. You've got two wooden ships. Now, at this point, the Monitor, Huasca, was held by Peruvian rebels.
Joyous lead in this battle, the British, the Royal Navy, tried to use one of their self-propelled torpedoes to take out the Huasca, uh, but that failed. In fact, the whole battle kind of fail failed because um, the frigate and corvette, and supported by two Peruvian artillery boats under Algernon Horsey, uh, didn't really push it because they couldn't really push much against an armored vessel. And Louise Estet, who was in charge of the ironclad, was just not that keen on it. The fact is. The Royal Navy had to withdraw. This was embarrassing as anything. There were even points in Parliament made why weren't ships like HMS Warrior, which was still considered a viable cruiser at the time, if not a, a battleship anymore, i.e. a ship full of battle, but definitely a cruising vessel, why was HMS Warrior not available? Because after all, Warrior was an ironclad. Not sure how well she'd have stood up to 300 pound 10 inch guns, but she would have had a far better chance of two wooden ships, even if they are, if, even if they have an iron hull. This is the point at which you realise that hang on gunboat diplomacy is in trouble. Yes, we can make a lot of lines about Jackie Fisher later on in history when he cuts down the Royal Navy's older vessels to try to build up the Dreadnought Force and concentrate in the Grand Fleet, well, the home waters and then eventually calling it the Grand Fleet. Um, we can concentrate about the fact that the sheer amount of damage he does to the naval diplomacy by getting rid of ships, but we should not abuse ourselves by believing that these vessels were necessarily the most combat-capable vessels in the world. This is the problem. Vessels in this case, even newer vessels than the actual Husqvar, which are not built to the level that they need to be, cannot deal with a vessel of the Husqvar's capability. This just made armoured ships the number one requirement for any nation around the world, because you have an armoured vessel, she's useful. She's useful. She can, she can drive off the Royal Navy. Now, her first years of service and procurement have been for war against Spain, in case, you know, Spain was still being a bit annoying. She took a little over two months to reach Peru originally from the UK, and this was because of various issues, including um, a collision with another ironclad Independencia. Okay, this I've been trying to put off pronouncing this Independencia, which I did get right, but I kept I have kept wanting to write uh, pronounce it Pendencia. And missing out the Inda. So, Independencia. The Independence. Nice name for a vessel. Basically, because the Independence's commander uh, was a bit. How do I put this politely? Independent in their approach to the world. Alaska had a long career. A long career. Think about it, she served with Peru from 1866 when she's commissioned till 1879. So that's 13 years already. And she serves with Chile from 1879 to 1897. 
So, in total terms, she serves 31 years. Thirty-one years, she was felt to be, well, if not viable, then usefulness of, for minor powers in South America to keep her available, to keep her in the service. And she gives them good service, which I know I said a couple of times before, but... It's as I'm looking through the list of officers who've commanded her, including, of course, Miguel Grau, who is one of the most famous Peruvian naval officers of all time. Uh, he's got so many decorations. Basically, he is the ace of the aces. The four aces of the Peruvian Navy was one of the things that went around at one point for Peru in terms of their independence and their, their security and their sort of their, their general national morale. He ends up being promoted to a Grand Admiral posthumously. He fought in the Civil War, the, the Chincha Islands War, the War of the Pacific, the Battle of Abata, the Battle of Inqui, the, ba the capture of Rimac, and the Battle of Anangos. And, of course, Angmos is the next battle I'm going to be talking about. 1879, Battle of Angmos. Right, you have on one side Miguel Grau. Who was, of course, in charge of a Peruvian monitor and corvette. On the other side, you have Chile. You have Juan Le Jose Latour and Gaviano Cardenas, who are in charge of two armoured frigates, two corvettes, and two transports. Mm -hmm. Now, this battle is one of those important battles because it's a battle between... Armoured frigates firing armour-piercing projectiles and a monitor. It's basically the two philosophies of war going on. Is a monitor best? You know, these, these two really, really powerful guns inside a armoured vessel which keeps as low to the water as possible. Or are two ships which have a more conventional battery alignment, let's be honest, it's like this, it's like a ship of line. And even if it does have guns which are sort of angled out, various positions, jutting out from the vessel. But it looks more conventional, which is better. It was not a good fight for them to be in. And you have the fact that both the Almirante Cochran and the Blanco Encalada, who are also going to be discussed at various points in this, this current sort of video cycle going on, going through. They are both central battery ships. Um, the Almirante Cochran was built by Earl Shipbuilding Company in Hull, and the Blanco Enclada was also built in by Earl's Shipbuilding Company in Hull. So this was basically two hull ships versus a Birkenhead vessel. Please note what I said earlier about the major power in this region and what they're happy to do. Something to worth remembering. Anytime anyone says, oh, if we ever meet a major power in space who's even more powerful than us, they are definitely going to be benevolent. Mm-hmm. Always take every benevolence with a pinch of salt. Now, the Chileans had basically been ordered to take out this ship and her commander, whatever the cost. And the fact is, Grau starts off the battle by pretty much ordering his corvettes, the Union, to escape to Peru. Because there was no point in losing both ships. He was outnumbered. He, had two, he was against two armoured frigates, uh, a wooden schooner, 
a Corvette, and two transports. Now, the whole purpose and the whole plan of the fight was to pretty much use those armoured vessels, the Blanca, the Concrane, to basically surround the Huasca, to keep it constantly having to fire and fight and never be able to concentrate its guns on just one ship. And they did that. They did it. The battle starts. Oh wait, thirty hours. Between when the Huska and the Blanco Enclada have managed to reduce the range from to three thousand meters. Grau opens fire at oh nine twenty five hours on the conch crane first. The tour doesn't answer. Keeps trying to get closer and closer. Eventually when they get to 2,200 meters, that's when they engage. It's at 10.55 hours. That they must have boarding parties over an hour and a half later. And at 11.08 hours, that um, roughly 20 sailors boarded the Huasco without resistance. Ninety minutes. Of fire and fury. Of armor, of palliser type armor piercing rounds that explode right after penetrating the hull, taking her down. And yet, they repair her. They reinvigorate her. And as you can see, she's still around. She's still very much worth a visit. She survived the Chilean earthquake and the resulting tsunami with no damage and was, you know, has been reopened with only being closed for refit since 2011. She is a memorial ship to not just really the Chilean Navy of the time, but to pretty much all the navies at the time in South America. And it's a reason why we talk about the navies in South America with so much interest because they were actually fighting. They were often fighting wars with very equivalent equipment. And this is one of the reasons why so many European nations and America are paying attention to them. But also why you find it kind of funny when you're looking back, when, well, some people find it funny when looking back that there's the dreadnought race that goes on in South America, but other people find it funny that, you know, sort of looking back going, why were the Europeans and other powers actually not thinking that thinking that the British or other people were lying when they said this, 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 these were ships the South Americans were procuring? Look at what they'd been procuring just a few years earlier. You know, they like big ships. They like powerful ships. Well, they do, because they see them as the guarantors of their independence. You know what happens when Peru loses these ships? They go and buy new ones, even bigger and better ships. They don't go, oh, we've lost our ships. Oh, our Navy, woe is us. We must now enter 40 years of mourning and cry and give up on never having a Navy. No, they go, frigate. We lost ships. Hello, is this Lads? Right then, we'd really like to see what you do in a... Uh 1880 version, you know, maybe something, maybe something a little bit cuter. Does it have nice lines? How are the engines? Can we add more guns? Please, pretty please. Oh yeah, check blank. Go by. 
Because for them, naval power is about their national survival. Anyway, so far, first versions of this, of this video have been very, very long. So I'm just clicking through this bit. Uh, we've got come up. Justify a Navy, Navy to Continent. That's gone out this week. And gas turbines are coming next week. Hope you're going to enjoy those. Anyway. I hope you found it interesting. I usually try and end some of these videos with questions. And what I would really like people to do, especially if they don't know much about South American naval history, but if they even if they if they do, also does, what is the most surprising thing you have learned about South American naval history when you've done your reading? And yeah. How often do you think that the how often have you found out the battles where one shipyard in the UK built all five ships involved in the battle? Fighting for three different nations. That's a good battle to look up. I'm going to leave this video live for a long time because my plan is to cover that battle actually next year at some point. So I won't answer the question or confirm or deny which battle that is, other than if you sort of comments, I'll probably like it if you get the right battle. But um, next year I will... If everything works out, next year I will do a video about that, uh, that battle. Thank you very much for watching, and hope you enjoyed. Toodles.